Hello, I have prepared a presentation on different areas where modulus appears and plays some role. Let's recall first definition. And for that, one has to know the notions of rectifiable path, that they have arc length parameterizations. In particular, they have Lipschitz parameterizations. And from that, they must know how to integrate Borel functions along path and be comfortable with these notions in metric spaces. About all of these, I have separate uh, chapters on the channel you can check out. But starting there, we can easily define for a family of non-constant path and a given measure on a metric space, the P modulus as follows. First, we look at what is called admissible functions for this family. That is Borel functions whose integrals along every single path in this family is at least one, every rectifiable path here. And then by definition, the P modulus of this family is the smallest LP norm over all admissible functions. So we've been dealing with examples for some time in this channel, but I never mentioned some of its key properties Historically, the inverse of this quantity, one over mod p gamma, which is called extremal length had been used, but due to the properties that you're about to see, uh, it's more natural to actually work with the modulus as we've defined it. First of all, if you have a larger collection of curves, the modulus increases. All of these are, by the way, easy to prove, some of them even trivially. And if you have a countable collection of path, and if you put them all together, the modulus is less than the summation of the moduli of individual families. And in general, uh, the more curves you have in a family, and the shorter they are, the modulus becomes larger. And the shorter they become can be defined in the following sense that every curve in your gamma 2 family has a sub subcurve that belongs to the gamma one family. Actually, that also has been denoted by something like gamma one less than or equal to gamma two, uh, as opposed to being a subset. But anyway, these give mod p some measure like behavior, whether it's actually a measure, we can define measurable collection of families or not, is not really important. So I've never seen anyone trying hard to specifically decide if this is a measure or not but the properties that we've listed are the most important to us. So concrete examples, if we are in R2 with the usual metric and usual measure, Lebesgue measure, and we take P equal two, which is just natural because we're in two dimension, we're in complex plane. We have been talking about the first one here that all the paths that connect the opposite sides of a rectangle will have modulus b over a. Notice how this goes in line with the previous claim that the more path you have and the shorter they are, the modulus becomes larger. So if you, here we're talking about uh, a being the length of these paths, the distance between the opposite edges and b is the height. So the more b is, the more curves horizontally you connect. And this can easily be proven by Fubini's theorem, which is a Quite nice exercise. The next exercise I already did in two videos. It was lengthier and more technical than I had anticipated. Then the good news is now we have them on the channel. Uh, and that is the moduli of annuli, which plays a key role in all dimensions. Um, and uh, it depends only on the ratio of the inner and outer radius, as you see. From this fact alone, we can actually prove that the moduli of all of paths that go through one particular point is zero without loss of generality of taking origin here. So that is a recall of moduli, how it works. It's often very difficult to calculate precisely, and these are very special cases. So as many good things in math and analysis 
modulus is a gift from complex analysis. So it was observed that if you have two open domains in complex plane, and if you have a conformal map, a, a holomorphic injective function from U to U prime, then any path family that you take in the domain will have the same modulus as its image family in the target. And by image family, F gamma, we mean you take a gamma in the domain and you compose it with F. Because F is C infinity function, in particular it's Lipschitz, any rectifiable curve will map to a rectifiable curve. We also did prove this uh, in the previous lecture, if I'm not mistaken. What is amazing is that the converse is true. So this property indeed um, characterizes conformal maps. So if you start with a homeomorphism, all you know is that it is a homeomorphism plus the moduli is preserved under this map. It then turns out that your function is indeed a holomorphic injective function. In particular, it has C infinity smoothness and even beyond its, uh, its CW, its analytic function. So that's very, very strong claim. Uh, this gives if and only conditions for when two annuli are conformal. And because of that previous calculation, two annuli will be conformal if and only if this ratio is the same for them. And if it's not, there is no conformal map between them. Similarly, for the um, rectangles, if you have two rectangles, you can map one conformally to the other while sending the vertices to the vertices in the same, uh, say, anti-clockwise order. You can do that if and only if this ratio B over A is the same for the two of them. Indeed, this was uh, the original Gerich problem, which motivated the notion of quasi-conformal functions. So. Grosch asked, now that you cannot map this conformally to the other one, what is the closest to being a conformal map that can do it? And this making precise what we mean by being close to conformal means, which ended up uh, giving us the notion of quasi-conformal maps. So the term apparently was coined by Alforce. Uh, around 1936 or so, but the origin, of course, goes back to Grish. And the same also goes with annuli. If you cannot map them conformally, then you can map them by quasi-conformal map. I uh, will uh, give one definition of quasi-conformality next. And uh, this uh, preservation of modulus can be used in different contexts to prove or disprove that some map is conformal. Um, for example, in uh, if you want to know if a unit, if a limit of sequence of conformal maps is still a conformal map, you can uh, check whether the modulus is preserved. Okay, so the quasi-conformal maps definition that I promised is here. So um, we saw that in the in the complex plane, conformal maps preserve modulus. So modulus of F gamma is exactly equal to modulus of gamma. So quasi-conformal will be that we don't have equality, but we have a universal control, a multiplicative universal control that it can increase it by K times or decrease it by one over K, but not worse. So a um, homeomorphism, and, and now the, the other aspect about modulus is that this is defined on any metric space. Uh, un, unlike, say, definition of conformality through derivatives in the complex plane or Riemann, Cauchy Riemann uh, equations, which is, of course, non existent on a general metric space. However, however, we can still formulate modulus and this inequality there. So we can define these. Um, in, in more generality, one 
natural context, which doesn't allow uh, very stupid counter examples, is when you have Alfors Q regular spaces with Q strictly bigger than one. And by Alfors Q regularity means that the measure of a ball of radius R is comparable multiplicative constant to R to the power Q. And no matter where the center is, and uh, as long as the radius is less than diameter of the space. So we can use this as a definition of quasi-conformality. And, but then there are at least two other definitions of quasi-conformality if you are in Rn through um, usual derivatives. So for example, we can say that a Sobola function is quasi-conformal if it's a Jacobian uh, can control the norm of the derivative up to powers. And then um, there's also the infinitesimal metric definition of quasi-conformality. Some of the fundamental, one of the fundamental results in, in the theory is that these three definitions coincide if we deal with uh, open domains in Euclidean spaces. And, and so we see that the Sobel of regularity and uh, Jacobian inequality definition of quasi-conformality, which a priori has nothing to do with path, ends up being equivalent to preservation of the modules. So this led Pinon and Koskela to develop a theory of quasi-conformal maps in general metric measure spaces. And they showed that in spaces that are so-called spaces with controlled geometry, uh, a lot of analogous results to the Euclidean case can be recovered. Um, and this is where they define notions of upper gradients and notions of abstract Poincaré inequality and lunar spaces in their very famous 1998 paper. Um, what they prove, for example, is that if you have a quasi-conformal map between such a pair of such spaces, then uh, it's actually quasi-symmetric, which is a much stronger condition. And also they end up belonging to Sobolev classes, Sobolev functions in the appropriate sense. Uh, but the, the again, the, the key notion bringing all of this together is that of moduli of path. So for this theory to be, um, to work for these equivalences to work, one has to have a lot of curves in the metric space. Um, and learner spaces defined again there in a quantitative way tells you that there are indeed a lot of rectifiable path between any two given points in the space. And what is this quantitative uh, measurement of you have a lot of curves, of course, modulus. So um, the more precise definition of a learner space, if you have if you have two continuum, if you have two compact connected sets, which are not intersecting, then the modulus of all the paths that connect them is, is has a lower bound in terms of the relative distance of the two, uh, the two um, continuum. With the relative distance, we mean their distance, but corrected by dividing by the larger of the diameter of the two. So um, distance versus their size. And again, that's where modulus plays an important role. We'll come back to this also again later. Another place where I've seen modulus appear is um, the uniformization theory. So a uniformization is when you have a metric space that looks like a simpler model space. And then you ask whether your metric space is equivalent to that space in much stronger sense. For example, let's say you start with a metric space that is homeomorphic to a sphere. 
right? Spheres are quite well understood and simple uh, objects. So you have a, an abstract metric space, which is homeomorphic to a sphere. What more conditions do you need on this metric space to guarantee that there is a quasi-conformal homeomorphism onto the sphere, or even better, a quasi-symmetric homeomorphism on the sphere? One of the uh, cornerstone results is a result due to um, Bunken Kleiner. A more recent uh, result is due to Kai Rayala, who proves when two-dimensional metric spaces, which is called uh, metric surfaces, um, are quasi-conformal equivalent to a two-dimensional standard space, which is a plane, in the non-compact case, a sphere, in the uh, closed manifold case, and also uh, the unit disk with the boundary case. And it turns out the very fundamental property required of the metric space, uh, basically a sufficient and necessary condition for a metric surface to admit a quasi-conformal map onto one of these spaces is what is called reciprocality. Reciprocality tells us that Okay, so let's look at the usual rectangle in the complex plane. We saw that the module of the path connecting opposite edges is B over A, the length of the rectangle. Now, if you took the, the other pair of uh, edges in the rectangle, then the modulus by the same formula will be A over B. So we see that the moduli of path that run horizontally and connect the vertical edges is one over the modulus of the other path family, uh, we can call the dual path family, which runs vertical and connects the two horizontal edges of the rectangle. It turned out, due to this amazing uh, result of Kai Rayala, that if you have a metric surface, if you have a metric space that is homeomorphic to R2, and then for every topological rectangle, which is just a homeomorphic image of the usual rectangle, for every topological rectangle, this property of reciprocality of modulus holds, then your space is quasi-conformally equivalent to the plane. And this quasi-conformality upgrades to quasi-symmetry under some more geometric assumptions on the space. Uh, this is, um, there are maybe other technical assumptions on the space, but the core, the very, pivotal idea was this reciprocality of modulus. So we see that just in terms of modulus, you can characterize when a metric metric space that is homeomorphic to R2 is indeed quasi-conformally equivalent to it. Okay, the next, um, but connected to some of the previous notions, topic where uh, modulus plays a role is analysis on metric spaces. I wanna remind, uh, this notion of upper gradient, it's quite uh, intuitive and very, very nice. It's just the fundamental theorem of calculus done in abstract setting. We say a Borel function on a metric space, non-negative, but could take also infinity. We say such a function is a upper gradient of another function if uh, this inequality, if integrating the gradient along any path, bounds the difference of the values of the function at the two ends of that path. So this is required for, of course, every pair of points and every rectifiable path joining them. Okay, um, using this notion, Schamrigulingham around 2000 introduced what is called Newtonian solo spaces, which are basically measurable functions that are in LP, and have a gradient, have an upper gradient that is also in LP. If that happens, we call the function, we say that the function is in the space N1P. And this may not be that interesting if the space has no rectifiable curves, it may just coincide with LP class of functions. But if your space does have rectifiable curves, and many of those, 
it becomes a very interesting uh, space, which allows you to do a lot of potential theory and first order analysis on metric spaces. And how do we measure, how do we know if a space has a lot of rectifiable curves? Again, the notion of modulus and uh, learner spaces, especially, right? Those um, which have lots of path between any two given continuum. The key notions are learner spaces, Poincare inequalities. If you have Poincare inequalities, these Newtonian spaces coincide with other notions of subular functions previously defined on metric measure spaces. Uh, but then there is this important link that basically uh, under natural assumptions, having a Poincare inequality is equivalent indeed to being a learner space. So everything boils down to having a lot of curves in the sense of modules. So I think that brings me to the end of my slides, but one more topic that I wanted to mention was a discrete modulus. The notion of modulus um, has been and can easily be done with discrete objects like graphs. And uh, you can also estimate a given metric space by graphs. Uh, you can recognize the space as the boundary of an infinite graph. And then you can talk about modulus of uh, path, which are just a collection of uh, edges in, in that graph. Uh, it has been uh, used in uh, various contexts to produce uh, interesting things. So. That's why um, I believe that modulus of path families is a notion that deserves to be better known and uh, maybe some courses have to uh, devote some time to that. The only difficulty I see why it's almost never covered in undergraduate courses is um, there's some background needed. First of all, you need this theory of uh, path metric spaces or even like in Euclidean setting. Uh, then you need some knowledge of uh, LP theory, right? Because the definition takes into account that. Uh, but it's still one, one for, for, for advanced undergraduate courses, uh, this could be integrated into, into one of the courses and I think it uh, deserves that attention. Thank you so much for uh, watching this far and I may.